good morning. Good morning. I'd like to welcome all of you to worship here at College Hill this morning. Those of you who are joining us online or on Zoom, uh, rather on our, uh, uh, what's it called? YouTube channel. Well, welcome as well. My goodness <laughs> sakes, what a start. Um, I was, because I was thinking, why does it always start raining right as we're supposed to start worshiping? So it's another one of those days. Glad you are here. Please find a worship register and sign in. Pass it down back again to see who you're worshiping around this day. And uh, a few announcements. I'll draw your attention to the bulletin insert. Uh, the first is, is actually one that's not uh, in the insert, or is it? It is. It's the second one. Uh, coming up on the Thursday of this week, our own director of music ministry, Kim Childs, will be with a, a pianist to have a concert and at the Lorton Performance Hall. Uh, there's a flyer on the information table if you'd like more information and it's also, I see there in, as well. Well, believe it or not, this week begins the season of Lent. And as is our tradition, we will have an Ash Wednesday service here. We start at 5.30 p.m. with a monastic soup supper. If you've never been to a monastery, what that basically means is it's kind of a bare bones meal, soup and crackers and water, and we eat in silence while spiritual readings are read. And then after about 20, 30 minutes, probably less than that, we'll come into the sanctuary for the service of imposition of ashes. So that is a really uh, deeply personal and wonderful way to start the season of Lent starting this Wednesday. Um, please also note that on Sunday, February 18th, that's next uh, week, several different things. Uh, first of all, our Let's Just Do It small group will be meeting yet again, and they are gonna be focusing particularly on education and what we can do as individuals and as a congregation to hold ourselves accountable to help promote healthy education in our state and certainly within the Tulsa public school system and the surrounding area. There's also a box out there, it's part of our Let's Just Do It small group program, uh, to bring underwear and socks for those at the day center for the homeless. So please contribute to that. Uh, you all, I also want to mention, I mentioned this right before Christmas, that my home church pastor in the Woodlands Community Presbyterian Church, he was the organizing pastor. I was there after their first year before their first building. Uh, uh, Twelve different people from that congregation, of, they ended up with about three, four hundred people, went to seminary. Twelve people from a church that size ended up going into ministry. Uh, I'm part of his memorial service. He passed away on Christmas Day, and I will be gone next Sunday. Uh, pastors normally don't leave on the first Sunday of Lent, but I will be gone, and Reverend Gordon Edwards will be preaching, and that will be uh, a wonderful experience. Uh, please note after that, uh, Tuesday the 19th, and he's here this morning, our own Matt Gallagher is releasing his latest novel, it's called Daybreak, and there will be a book signing, um, the event sponsored by Magic City Books um, and others, it says there. Uh, there's a link, there's a bunch of information there also in our monthly newsletter that just went out. I'm excited about that? We're excited for you, Matt. That's wonderful. Um, that's enough. Uh, yo, yes? Could you add about that? Yes, well, please, as always, read the, the rest of the things. We are in need of an additional uh, tutor. Let's see, where is that? That's the second to last thing. Uh, one of our own, Gretchen Horakovic, moved to Pennsylvania, and one of the families is in need of a tutor on Thursday afternoon. Uh, is that correct? Uh, let's see, to keep their one and three-year-olds entertained while parents and older children learn reading. Is that it? Okay, take a good look at that. That's a very important part of our uh, Afghan uh, ministry. Let us then now continue to prepare our hearts and minds to worship God as we listen to this morning's prelude.
please rise in body or in spirit for our invitation to worship. We gather here in your presence, O oh God. Remind us, O oh Creator, that the life is worth living. We seek transformation as individuals, a community of faith, and a society. Remind us, O oh Christ, that the struggle for justice is worth undertaking. We come as we are because you invited us to come. Remind us, O oh Spirit, that love and action are one. of God, let us join together in our prayer of confession. Surprising God, whose love leads us to new experiences, forgive us when we fail to recognize your sacred presence in the sights and sounds of the shape. What have we missed because our eyes are closed to what was happening around us? Who has cried presence is with and within each of us to bring healing and wholeness. Let us therefore forgive one another. May God of grace and love strengthen us in all goodness. Amen.
Peace before us, peace behind us, peace under our feet. Peace within us, peace over us. Let all around us be peace. And the peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. Uh, at this time, I'd like to invite the children of the church to come. about a lot of Bible stories is we learn a lot from people who've painted, made paintings about them. For instance, like our stained glass window, I'll just show you one. See this one right here? What is that? It's a boat. Uh, it's a sailboat. No, it's not a pirate ship. It's a sailboat. <laughs> Maybe it was a pirate ship. And like the one up there, there's something in red. See that little red piece? What is that? Yeah, that's a person in the boat. So guess what? There's a biblical story about that, about Jesus' disciples being in the boat. And Jesus, there's several different stories. Actually, one, Jesus walks on the water to see them. Once they're in really rough seas and they're scared, and Jesus goes out to see them. So learning Bible stories through pictures is an important thing. So I'm going to show you some, and you get to guess. What? First of all. Why is the person red? Because whoever made the stained glass window 60 years ago decided it should be red. There's no reason. I don't know. What is this story? What do you see? First of all, what do you see in the picture? Jonah. I see Jonah. I see a ship and Jonah in the water. Yeah. And it's in the sea. It's a boy, it's a rough sea, isn't it? And so you know the story of Jonah and the whale. So we could just show you this picture and then you could study what it was about. So it's a very, it's a modern painting and it's very pretty. Uh, can you figure out this story? What do you see in this story, or in this painting? What do you see? You see a bunch of people, right? And what is this? Somebody breaking bread. What is the story? What is, how many people are in this picture? No, 5,000. <laughs> It could have been 18,000. It depends how you read the scripture. But um, this is the story of Jesus breaking the bread. Do you remember that story? He feeds the 5,000. Okay, this is the story for today. And I'm going to show you one version that I usually use. On, and uh, what do you see in this picture? You see... And then they're bowing down, right? And you can usually tell Jesus in a painting what, how. There's usually a crown or an aura kind of like thing, not a crown, but this light around his head. So you know that that's Jesus. Uh, and, and, but these two guys have 
round things around their head too. Who do you think that is? Does this story remind you? Does this picture remind you of a story? What about this picture? It's of the same story. This is what's on the cover of the bulletin. See, see the, the light around his head? So that would be Jesus. There's a guy here with a staff and a guy here with a sash. It looks like a shepherd. Well, guess what? Does anyone else know without knowing the title of today's thing that this was the story of the transfiguration? Okay, that's all I have to say. <laughs> Now, it's, it's, it's a tough one. Um, Jesus goes up a mountain, okay? So they're up on a mountain, and he goes with three of his disciples, and the Bible says it's, it's Peter, James, and his brother John. And as Jesus is standing on top of the mountain, two different people just appear. And one is Moses, and one is Elijah. Do you know where Moses and Elijah are historically? They're in the Old Testament. Jesus is in the New Testament. So these two Old Testament characters are sitting there talking to Jesus. And the one with the staff is what we call the lawgiver. That would be Moses. And the one who was a prophet, who's dressed like a prophet, is Elijah. And Jesus is talking to these Old Testament figures who just appear, and then a cloud comes over all of them. What happens with the cloud? Did you know the Old Testament stories, how Moses got the Ten Commandments? He went up the mountain and there was a, he saw a big cloud and it talks. And who is the person doing the talking? God. That's absolutely right. You guys are good. And God said in this story, this is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. And then the cloud disappears. And Peter wants to stay up on the mountain and build them little houses to stay in. But Jesus says, no, we got to go back down to down the mountain to where the people are to do ministry, to minister to them. So anyway, you probably never heard that story before, have you? Have you? You remember from last year? We do it every year. It's always the last Sunday before the first season, Sunday of the season of Lent, which we'll talk about. But my whole point today was to show that sometimes it's really good to look at art and then try to figure out the story because there's a lot of teaching. And that's how they used to teach before people could read. They'd show them something. And this was what's even called an icon in an Orthodox church. And these were all over the church. And they wouldn't worship these, but they'd look at them and try to learn the stories. So I want you guys to learn stories through art as well as just reading the Bible, which is important to do, okay? Let's pray. God of love and grace, we give you thanks for artists and painters that do uh, very interesting and different kind of paintings of the biblical stories. Help us to learn from them and what we can uh, get out of that as well as reading the scriptures themselves. Thank you for this creativity. And thank you for the children of this church and children everywhere. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Stay here. This is the third Sunday now in a row where I've asked you guys to stay, but then asked you to leave because somebody wasn't here. Who wasn't here the last two Sundays to be received as new members? I don't want to point anybody out, but it's you guys. So what I want you to do is I want you to stay here while we introduce this family because they are new members and we'll do that right now, okay? So hang on, would you like to come up? And would you two like to come up? This is the McRae family and our clerk of session will formally introduce them. live within walking distance of the church, which is quite wonderful to have someone from the neighborhood. And uh, the questions for membership is required by our Presbyterian Book of Order, as I told you, is now required to be asked in front of the congregation as well, is uh, do you trust Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior? So say, I do. 
And do you commit to the life, work, and ministry of this congregation? Now an address to the new members. <coughs> we, the members and friends of College Hill Presbyterian Church, joyfully express our welcome to you and affirm our mutual ministry. We covenant with you to work together as followers of the ways and teachings of Jesus in the places to which God calls us, growing in spirit and working for peace, equality, and justice. And now an address to the congregation. As members and friends of College Hill, do we make the commitment to our newest members to strive for healthy relationships, to reach for wholeness and authentic community, and to treat one another with respect and dignity. If so, please say, we do. We, we do. do. To one and all, let us strive together, guided by the Spirit, to further the kingdom of God in our midst and in the world, and to build an inclusive community of faith, receive and openly share the love of God, Reach out in a compassionate voice for peace and justice. And now the ceremonial highlight of any new member gathering are the name tags. Again, these are in green, and anyone else who's wearing a green name tag means they are also new members, and so everyone must make a special effort to greet and welcome those with our green name tags. And June, this is yours. And Evelyn, this is yours. Chelsea, tag, and Shane. <laughs> Let us pray. Loving and gracious God, we give you thanks for the McRae family, for drawing them here to this community of faith to share their love and gifts for ministry. May we all be open to one another in building relationships that are authentic and trusting, filled with integrity and love. Bless their time and ministry with us and ours with them. And we ask all this in deep gratitude. Amen. Amen. Congratulations. <laughs> Congratulations. And you guys can head to Worship Connection. scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today and what you call us to do. Amen. The Old Testament reading today is from the book of Exodus, chapters 20, 34, uh, verses 29 through 35. Moses came down from Mount Sinai as he came down from the mountain with the two tablets of the covenant in his hand. Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone because he had been talking with God. When Aaron and all the Israelites saw Moses, the skin of his face was shining and they were afraid to come near him. But Moses called to them and Aaron and all the leaders of the congregation returned to him and Moses and spoke with him. Afterwards, all the Israelites came near, and he gave them a commandment. All that God had spoken with him on Mount Sinai. When Moses had finished speaking with them, he put a veil on his face. But whenever Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he would take the veil off until he came out. And when he came out and told the Israelites, what he had been commanded, the Israelites would see the faces of Moses, 
that the skin of his face was shining, and Moses would put the veil on his face again until he went in to speak with God. gospel reading on this transfiguration of the Lord's Sunday is Mark's version of this story. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John and led them up a high mountain alone and apart by themselves. And Jesus was transfigured before them, and his clothes became dazzling white, such as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, is it good for us? It is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Peter did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them. And from the cloud there came a voice, this is my son, the beloved, listen to him. Suddenly when they looked around, they saw no one with them anymore, but only Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen until after the Son of Humanity had risen from the dead. God bless the reading and the hearing of this word. Amen. This amazing and bizarre story known as the transfiguration of Jesus fits for many of us into the category, I'm not sure whether it really happened, but I know that it is true. In other words, the important point isn't whether the language should be taken literally or metaphorically, but rather what it meant to the gospel writer concerning his understanding of Jesus. Jesus' identity and what it can mean to us today. So let's first look at what transfiguration actually means. The most 
The, rather, the root of this word comes from the Greek from which we also get the word metamorphosis. And the most common definition is a striking change in form or appearance, and it's usually added into a more beautiful, exalted, and spiritual state. Reminds me if you've ever looked at someone and it appeared as if they were almost glowing or had an aura about them. But then is the overall purpose of this story. Well, the description of Jesus' entire presence being bathed in dazzling brightness, again, whether literally or metaphorically, was used by the Gospel writer to express the internal shining of Jesus' divinity breaking forth into pure light. What a beautiful image. The interior shining of Jesus' divinity breaking forth into pure light. And in this story, Jesus goes up to an unnamed mountain with three of his disciples, Peter, James, and John. And Jesus is somehow transformed so that the appearance of his clothes shine an amazingly supernatural white. And suddenly standing next to Jesus and talking with him are Moses, the great lawgiver, and Elijah, the great prophet. And by the way, our Old Testament reading, as you heard from Exodus, relates the story of how the face of Moses shines brightly when he came from being in the presence of God. Well, the picture of these three of them standing together is meant to reveal how Jesus is a continuation of these two great traditions in Jewish faith, the law and the prophets, which make up almost the entirety of the Hebrew Bible, our Old Testament. And the author intends for his readers, his community of faith, to understand that Jesus is the Messiah, the one for whom the prophets spoke, the one who fulfills the law, the one who is from God and of God, and to whom, therefore, they should all listen. But Peter has a very interesting reaction and response. He quickly offers to build three dwelling places for them. And we'll look at what that means in a moment. Because Peter is interrupted when a cloud mysteriously comes and overshadows the terrified disciples. And echoing the same words heard at Jesus' baptism, a voice cries out from the cloud, This is my Son, the Beloved. Yet on this occasion, a command is added. Listen to him. And more on that in a moment as well. And when the voice is finished speaking, Jesus is found to be alone, and they all walk back down the mountain. Now, this story of the transfiguration is commonly used as one to talk about our own mountaintop experiences. And that has been my approach when preaching on this in past years. So I want to go back to that for just a moment and ask you to reflect upon your own spiritual experiences, perhaps at a specific moment in time or at a particular place, when you felt that you can only describe as being in the presence of God. We, of course, as we understand it, are always in that sacred presence of the divine that is beyond, among, and within us. Yet sometimes we experience that presence more intensely at certain times and places than in others. I know many have, for instance, at Dwight Mission or Ghost Ranch. And a common response, though, is to want to make that experience last. But as reflected in this biblical story, as much as the three disciples, as well as we ourselves, would like to hold on to them, they simply aren't meant to last. 
In an effort to do so, however, Peter offers to build three dwelling places so that they could stay in that moment. And his offer is both a recognition of the holy and an attempt to contain it. And who can blame him? But alas, spiritual experiences are something we do not have the power to contain. Therefore, though still etched deeply in our memory, we, like the disciples, have to head back down the mountain. Metaphorically, it is not on the mountaintop, but rather down in the valley, the level places where life is lived and the needs of the world press upon us. Therefore, crucial to a fuller interpretation of this transfiguration story is what immediately follows, what I didn't read. When they all come down the mountain, they immediately encounter a person who asks for a healing miracle for his daughter. So after a profound mountaintop experience, which the disciples wish to hold on to, they go right back down to the valley and find themselves in a situation where ministry is needed. We are reminded that mountaintop experiences, what I often like to call as God moments, are all too quickly followed by real life. Now, there is not a religion at any time or any place in history that hasn't perceived mountains as spiritual places where the divine can be encountered. And if we have learned anything from Celtic Christian spirituality, however, it's that any place, even the valleys and trenches and life can become a thin place where we encounter and experience God's presence. For there are indeed revelations, epiphanies, and moments of transfiguration in the commonplace, in the routines of everyday ordinary life. After all, if we believe that the whole world is filled with God's glory, then it makes sense that it is possible to recognize that glory from time to time, both around us and within us. So I ask, where do you, where have you, encountered the glory of God? Blogger on Pathios.com, Bruce Epperly adds, Only our vision prevents us from seeing the infinity of all things. God's glory is veiled by our failure to look deeply into life, settling for the surface rather than the inner life and light of all things. Epperly goes on with the following comment that may take a bit of reflection to fully understand when he writes, Yet the glory of God is also ethical in nature. Jesus Christ is our model of spiritual formation in his ability to mediate his divinity with the humanity of those around him. Conversely, we are called to mediate the humanity, our humanity, within the divinity, within all things. Think about what that implies. We are called to mediate our humanity with the divinity in all things. I really add something that I also think is intriguing. Our churches can become laboratories of mysticism, calling those who have encountered God to go out into the world, spreading the good news of God's loving companionship. But now, as Presbyterians, whether it's the need for more courage or the right words that don't impose our beliefs on others, perhaps we need to step out a little further in our efforts to share the good news with others. 
How can we, all of us as individuals and as a community of faith, more effectively let others know of a place like College Hill and that it exists and that they are welcome? So let's continue to reflect upon that and then take action. But I want to return now for just a moment to our biblical t text to make one additional, what I think is an important point. Interestingly, after the words, this is my son, the beloved, and we have talked about before how we believe that God also calls each of us the beloved, comes the only recorded command in the New Testament that is spoken by God directly to humans. God adds in reference to Jesus, listen to him. These words, listen to him, direct us to the understanding that being a follower of Jesus means not only doing what Jesus does, but also and perhaps, first of all, to listen to what Jesus says. It is in the listening that directs our attitudes and our actions, thus leading to an experience of our own transformation, our perhaps transfiguration. So, what are some of the words that we are commanded to listen to? Let us pause for a moment and take time to listen to these words. Follow me. Let your light shine. Forgive others. Be merciful. Be reconciled to one another. Keep your word. Go the second mile. Love your enemies. Seek first the kingdom of God. Ask, seek, and knock. Beware of false prophets. Be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Repent. Do not be anxious. Do not be afraid. Let the little children come to me. Honor your parents. Judge not. Watch and pray. Love God and your neighbor as yourself. And love one another. <coughs> How well do you and I really listen to what Jesus says? How well do we together as a community of faith? When we seek to live by these words of Jesus and when we experience the glory of God around and within us, God calls us to be transfigured, to let the divinity within us, within you, to shine forth, to let the divinity within you to shine forth. That's what it means to be created in the image of God. Therefore, let us also seek to see the divinity in others shine forth. In this season of Lent, time of serious reflection, which begins on Ash Wednesday in a few days, is an excellent opportunity to listen and to be transformed, perhaps even transfigured. Amen. Amen.
Let us join our hearts, minds, spirits, and voices together in our affirmation of faith. Christ, Christ calls us to live for our neighbors. Christ Jesus broadened the definition of neighbor to include those ordinarily despised and excluded. We believe Christ gives us and demands of us lives that recognize all people in all cultures as our neighbors on this planet. Christ teaches us to go beyond legal requirements in serving and helping our neighbor, to treat our neighbor's needs as our own, to care passionately for others' good, and to share what we have. Let's turn our offering and our resources of time and talent. In gratitude to God, let us gather our pledges and offerings. Collection plates are located just inside the sanctuary doors. You may also mail it in or donate on our church website. Or use our new QR code, which you'll find on the back of the, of the bullet. attention again to the bulletin insert, you'll see a listing of prayer requests. Uh, first, let me remind you that there is a large bowl out in the narthex uh, that says prayer requests and pieces of paper. If you have a request, please uh, write it down, put it in the bowl, and they are brought to me to be able to share with you. Uh, this morning, we have a couple from... We also have uh, a, a joy we do um He is a child of this church, uh, joining with his mother when he was 10 years old, 83 years ago. That is remarkable. Um, and he was thrilled to death to know that I was going to bring that up during our toys and concerns. Um, and, and also you see in there Jennifer Campbell continuing to record. to pray for peace and justice in Gaza and Israel 
and throughout the Middle East and Ukraine, and also within our own presbytery. I know I'm going to say this wrong. Is it Kulichito Church in Bethel? I saw some of that, so okay. Um, prayers for them, and also for First Presbyterian Church down in Hugo. So with those uh, requests, let us be together in a few moments of silent prayer. Thank you for reminding us this day, loving and gracious God, that there are indeed moments when we can experience your sacred presence in our midst and within us. And knowing that they don't always last, help us to recall them, especially when we find ourselves in need, knowing that you are indeed as close as our every breath. We come to you today to express our communal prayers for the world, knowing that you hear us and that the mystery of your love and power and presence may extend to those people and places for which we pray. We know you are the creator and the God of all, and we pray for the world. We pray that you will be at work in places that are full of violence and suffering those we have mentioned, and others. Please show us the path to peace and put the right people in the right places to make decisions not for themselves, but for others. And loving God, we also ask at this time that we pray for your care for the poor, the abused, and the cast out, we pray for those people now, and we pray for those who are without places to live. We pray for those who are poor and struggling to make ends meet. We pray for new immigrants and refugees to this country seeking asylum. We pray for the lonely. We pray for the sick, and those recovering. We pray for those who are grieving. And we pray for those who are cold and hungry. And if we are to play a role in providing those needs, gracious God, spark our hearts towards action. Thank you for hearing these prayers that have been spoken aloud and those that remain deep in our hearts as we now pray together. Our God, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
benediction, I'd like to ask the McCraes to please join us out in the narthex. You can get your daughters after the service so we can greet you. And on the bulletin board is a, a short write-up and photo of all the new members that came before session this last month. And actually, we're having a session meeting this Tuesday where we'll be receiving also new members. If you would like to join, please come then. So hear this. Go now in a spirit of peace, living a life that blesses others. We go into the world transformed and renewed on the mountain to overcome divisions and serve in the valleys of life. And as always, as you go from this place, know that God goes before you to lead you in the way, that God goes behind you to encourage you, that God goes above you to bless you, God goes beneath you to support you. God goes beside you to befriend you, and God goes within you to live your life to the glory of God, our creator, redeemer, and sustainer now and forevermore. Oh.